Students come to your MOOC with a variety of background experiences. How do you keep everyone appropriately challenged um, but not frustrated? It's a hard thing and I'm still learning. Uh, I think what I try to do is have levels of the course. So there's sort of a basic video which covers a concept. Then there's some applications for those who want to see sort of fun examples of how you can apply it. And then in many cases sort of technical additional videos on the graphics or mathematics that students might need to know for the AP exam. Um, you make a point in your MOOC videos about models being represented in three ways. Um, could you talk about those three ways that you represent models? Sure. So um, the three ways are first and most important is intuitively. Uh, the idea, you know, I don't expect most viewers of my videos to go on and get a PhD in economics, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, I expect they're going to go out and have other jobs and do other things, and I want them to be more educated consumers of news uh, and to understand what's going on in the world in terms of economic policy. And so intuitive is the most important. Uh, the second is mathematical, that um, as Paul Samuelson, the most famous economist of the 20th century, taught us here at MIT, uh, you, with the tools of mathematics, you can very quickly move from one intuition to another. You can quickly derive important lessons. And so mathematics provides a useful framework for doing that. And the third is graphical, because much like the mathematics, uh, graphics is another way that you can really take a lot of words, uh, you know, a graph is worth a thousand words, and so you can take a lot of intuition and compress it fairly nicely into a graph. And do you usually recommend representing or uh, teaching the models in that order, intuitively, mathematically, graphically? Uh, I sort of think of it as a bit of a sandwich. Mm -hmm. So to start with the intuition, then sort of going to the graphics next. The mathematics, typically for most consumers of this course, they won't need to know. Uh, so that's sort of last and often in, in, the, in this course. In the, um, in the edX course, not often covered. Uh, but then I like to come back to the intuition at the end. I think it's important both going in that you understand why you're doing something and having done it, you understand what you learned. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, could we talk a minute about the real world applications? It's okay. a really interesting part of the course. You have uh, LeBron James's college decision, the Uber uh, surge pricing. Uh, Tell us about your decision to really anchor the course with these, um, these real-world applications. It's what makes economics fun. I mean, once again, I'm not training people to be economics PhDs here. I'm training people to think like an economist. And thinking like an economist, you know, if, you're, if you've got a very facile mind and you sort of look at the basic theory videos I teach you, you can understand it. But you only really understand something when you go out in the real world and apply it. And so it's a chance for people to see the ways that economics rules the world, but to also sort of apply what they learn to make sure they understand it. Uh, what tips for educators do you have about selecting really good applications? Selecting really, first of all, have really good assistants with the course who can help you find the applications. I had excellent yeah. assistants with this class uh, to help me find okay. a lot of great applications. Okay. Uh, but second of all, I think it's just a matter of trying to find examples in the real world that are relatable to students, that are companies they've heard of and issues they think about. Uh, and that in a not necessarily obvious way teach you about the lessons you want to learn. Uh, that, you know, that, that basically sort of, you know, I have an application in the course about demand and supply about Kim Kardashian tweeting herself out a picture of an exercise corset and that it increased demand for exercise corsets. Yeah. And that's not an obvious link you draw when you see that video. No. <laughs> and so thinking about how something where students can see it and say, wow, I hadn't realized that economics helps me think about that problem. Let's talk about blending. I'm sure there are many economics educators who are looking at your course. Um, what tips do you have for them for how they might use the ideas in the course to enhance their face-to-face -face teaching? Yeah, I think that uh, the idea is that the teacher is still the key conduit, that live learning is still better than video learning, uh, and that there's still that's where the real face-to-face uh, -face learning happens, um, and that I hope that the teachers will think about this as a complement to the face-to-face -face teaching. Now, how it complements can be different ways. Some people is with the flipped classroom, where they like doing problem solving in class and sort of more of the learning happens online. That's not my preference. I prefer to think of it as teach it two different ways. Hmm. You know, let it be online and then teach a different example you like or a different approach to the problem you like. These are hard issues. And there may be, I'm not claiming that I know the best way to explain it. I've chosen one way to explain it. And I think that 
it's just repetition is really critical with complicated concepts like this. I think the mm -hmm. idea is to think of it as a belt and suspenders approach. Hmm. To say, okay, here's how John Gruber approached it. That's great. Now I think about it slightly differently. I want to approach it this way. I want students to do both and then together bring together a richer understanding of the topic. What are some practical things that educators can do to prepare students to use economic methodologies to solve problems in the world? I think the main number one thing is just to teach a healthy respect for the scientific method. <laughs> that basically to teach students that there are objective truths and that there's a scientific met, long standing scientific method for how we get, th get at them. The other thing, however, is to recognize that there are two sides of almost every issue. And that this is something that a lot of students at MIT sometimes have problems with my class, which is it's not just an equation with run right answer. There's pros and cons to a lot of these things. So I think it's teaching a search for the objective truth that can help you come to the conclusion that works for you. That there's not necessarily one right answer. You and I might disagree about a topic, but we should agree an objective set of facts and have a, have a, have a scientific method for getting to our conclusion. And I think that's, that's the key, in the today's world especially, that's, that's the key. It's just getting people to have a healthy disagreement rather than unhealthy disagreement. In the final module of the MOOC, you make a point of uh, providing students with pathways that they might use or follow to use what they've learned in the course in their future careers or in you know, other aspects of their lives. Economists are in high demand in the world of business, law, and government. Some of the most exciting new jobs in the IT economy are filled by economists. For example, companies like Amazon and Google are seeking out economists to help them understand how to better run their businesses and achieve their goals. Tell us about why this was important to you to like explicitly call out pathways for students to use their economic knowledge. I feel that economics is enormously powerful. I'm what you might call an imperialistic economist. I feel like economics can explain lots of things in the world and there's very few situations where a good economic framework can't help you at least go forward in thinking about it. And I don't want students to just take the AP test and forget about it. Uh, quite frankly, I want this to be something they bring with them um, and, uh, and actually keep with them. You know, it's a famous old Saturday Night Live skit about what you remember five years after college and it's five minutes and three and a half minutes of its spring break. Right. You know, I, I, want, I, I want them to try to have a basic set of intuitions that they can understand, can apply to decisions they're going to make about how much to save in their 401k to how hard to work, to what car to choose, to how to buy a house, et cetera. Like a set of things, uh, and quite frankly to me personally, to how to vote and think about public policy. You know, a set of tools that they can bring to bear on thinking about these important problems in America today. What else would you like to add about teaching microeconomics that we haven't touched on today? I think the main thing I'd like to add is this imperialistic view that it affects everything. Uh, microeconomics is basically economics. Macroeconomics essentially applied micro. Uh, it, it's basically, it's about every, th every decision we make, every decision firms make, uh, can all be informed by e economic framework and they can be informed in a particularly healthy way today because the economic framework really is about trade-offs and about thinking the fact that nothing's easy, <laughs> everything involves pros and cons and trade-offs and there's shades of gray to every decision we make. And I think the main thing an economics course can do in this day and age is get people to be a little more flexible, a little more thoughtful about decisions they make, and seeing both sides of the problem.